So uh, this is the draft statement. You can read it here. We'll read through it. And then afterwards, the team will be up here, and we have a copy that you can actually look at and uh, write your suggestions on it if you want to contribute that. So um, the Manila Statement on Hybridity in Diaspora Mission. Convening as educators and ministry leaders in diaspora mission at the Lausanne Consultation on Hybridity, Diaspora, and Missio Day, sponsored by the Global Diaspora Network and in partnership with the Biblical Seminary of the Philippines. We recognize that our sovereign God is at work among the diaspora peoples of the world and that hybridity is a mixture of elements rooted in ethnicity, culture, and identity. We affirm that we embrace the growing universal phenomenon of hybridity, that we want to enhance our understanding of hybridity and its implication for the mission of God, that we need expanded vision, ongoing dialogue, and fresh perspectives to overcome our cultural, ethnocentric, and theological blind spots. That we long for redeemed hybrid people to be unleashed for the mission of God. We challenge the global church to embrace God's heart for hybrid people, to celebrate the enriching dimensions of hybridity, and to address the opportunities and challenges for ministry that hybridity brings to families, congregations, and communities. So that's the draft statement. And we've tried to um, embrace and represent the tone and the direction that we feel the presentations have gone. We've gone back through our notes and, and hopefully we've done that. So I wanna thank the committee for the hard work that they've put into it and we'll be up here afterwards. So if you're interested in getting a hard copy, put your hand up. We got a few. Uh, okay. <laughs> we got more than... Uh, all of them. Okay. <laughs> Not all of them. Uh, because I, I want you to know this is a draft. The final copy may be available uh, at the end of uh, session tomorrow. But for we, if you're taking the draft, it is for you to uh, critique it, improve it, suggest okay uh, so if you have that in mind put your hand up now okay we got a thing. About 20 i'll make copies and have them up here afterwards uh, uh, distribute them now give give to those who can uh, so why don't we cover this side and then this side we can run off uh, more copies so uh, for our community service May I call on uh, Dr. Joy Tira to lead us in the communion service. I have asked uh, six brothers to help me in this uh, celebration of the Lord's table. Would you please make your way here? It is only appropriate that we end this consultation by celebrating communion. I was a pastor for 25 years, and I told my parishioner, if there is anything they should not miss, once a month is coming together before the head of the church, the Lord of the church, 
the Lord Jesus, who is the host of this table. One Sunday morning after communion, when my son was about nine or ten year old, he came to me with this theological question. He said, Dad, can I take communion now? I received Jesus into my heart. And by the way, he asked, when will this communion end? You do this every month, first Sunday of the month, and I just sit down in the corner. Why do you do this every month? When will this end? I look at my son, Tony, and I told him, Tony, this will not end until Jesus come again. Because these elements are just pictures of him. One day, someday, I hope very soon, you and I will see Jesus because when we see him face to face, we no longer have communion. So, for every child of God who is a follower of Jesus Christ, every day he must yearn and long for the return of Jesus. This morning, I woke up early and I prayed, oh God, I don't think I am prepared to lead communion. With my sinfulness, I'm not qualified. But you are merciful, you are gracious, I take courage to lead. So, instead of me revisiting New Testament passages that you all know, I have asked my brothers who came from different perspectives of ministries to share with us tonight. Instead of me in front of you mumbling, mumbling, I think it's important that we hear from them. Did you know that there is only one world leader who did not allow a memorial to be erected for him? Have you been to the city of Paris? Oh, you see that big art. The conqueror, Napoleon. About 10 miles away from the school is a huge monument of the national hero of the Republic of the Philippines. Dr. Jose Rizal. But Jesus never erected a monument for him. Mysterious. As I learned theology, I thought maybe the Lord Jesus did not want his presence to be confined in Israel. So, wherever the redeemed people of God come together like this, there is the memorial. 
we don't have to go to Lonita or to France or to the memorial monument in Washington, D.C. We don't have to go back to Jerusalem to behold the beauty and the power and the majesty of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords because he is here right among us. Bear in mind, he is the host. We are his guests. So, before we partake, I would like to ask my six brothers to share, or five of them, and then after the communion, I will ask one of the most senior missionary among us, Dr. Ron Adikari, to lead us in prayer for healing. Because uh, there are some of us here who have health emotional issues. It is important that we pray for one another and experience depressed thoughts of the hand of our master. So, how do we start this? I will ask my brother from Ethiopia. I have but one question to them. We had breakfast this morning, and I said, I want you to share. How do you celebrate communion in your context in Ethiopia, in the mega city of Toronto, in a hybrid church? Um, we will hear from our dear brother, what does it mean to celebrate communion among the Romanga refugees, the persecuted church of Myanmar. We will hear from one of the pastors growing denomination in the Philippines how it is to experience in a new way communion among your local churches, the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Then Pastor Jackie Lau, who pioneered the Chinese work among the CNMA in the Middle East or Gulf region, he successfully planted a church in the city of Dubai among the Chinese community. He will also come here and share. Did we not agree that you only share for five minutes? 10 minutes? Five minutes. Good evening. Uh, Greeting you from uh, Ethiopia, from the land of Shiva, uh, the land of uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, it's uh, been a pleasure uh, to, to partake these few days with you. Um, in Ethiopia, it's interesting. Uh, we uh, enjoy uh, eating together. Uh, we sit in a big circle when you eat, so you use your fingers and uh, you eat your injera, and you feed one another uh, with uh, gurshas, we call them gurshas, where you feed one another. So having a communion and uh, sitting and eating together is part of our uh, culture. So, uh, but in a Bible college setting, we have students coming from different denominations. So um, some come and uh, focus on uh, very becoming very emotional and uh, would prefer to cry during the uh, uh, Lord's Supper 
and then others come and uh, come with a joyous tone uh, because of their upbringing and their denomination. So, uh, but in, a, in an academic setting, we would do it in uh, thinking about the uh, past, present, and uh, uh, future aspect of the Lord's Supper, where in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 11, uh, where Paul says, when you do this, do this in remembrance. So we remember the past, uh, the sacrifice of uh, Jesus on the cross for us, and that could bring up emotions uh, that we feel. But also, there is the part of uh, the text that says, you proclaim, uh, which is the present uh, today. When we are doing this uh, Lord's Supper, people who don't understand us will say, what are they doing? And uh, we see we are proclaiming the Lord. Uh, he has died for us, and then he's resurrected as well. But lastly, there is the part where it says, until he comes. So he is coming again in the future. So it's focusing on the present, the past, the present, and the future has been uh, one of the ways we do the communion in, in our Bible college setting with so many different denominations. So that's what I wanted to share with you, the past, the present, and the future aspect of this, the Lord's Supper. Okay, I'm, I'm from uh, Addis Ababa Bible College, uh, an Assemblies of God Bible College. I am the uh, uh, principal uh, there. Thank you. There's some here who are theologian and Bible teachers, missiologists, his school need teachers. Please. Uh, if you are planning to have your Easter end, I think a good place to go is Ethiopia and work with our brother in his school. He will welcome you. Pastor Brendan. Pastor Brendan, uh, I met him a couple of months ago. I was in the city of Toronto. I asked my friend, Nigel Pauls, I said, this Sunday, I don't want to go to my denominational church. I want you to take me to a hybrid church. I said, sure, I'll take you there. And he took me to the Toronto City Church, one of the most hybrid, multicultural church of Toronto. And I had the privilege of meeting Pastor Brendan, and thank you, Brendan, for coming together with your missions uh, pastor from Colombia. Colombia. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Joy. Good evening. So, as mentioned, I bring greetings from Toronto, Canada, and uh, from Toronto City Church. Uh, I just want to say thank you. It's been an incredible honor to be here the last couple of days. I know uh, Jar and I both have been extremely uh, inspired, challenged, stretched, uh, and many other adjectives I could put together. Um, just a little context as we share about communion uh, for our church family. Uh, as Dr. Joy mentioned, we are just very blessed by the Lord uh, to be a very uh, multicultural, working on being even more intercultural hybrid church. We have over 50 nations represented in our church, uh, either first or second generation members. Uh, and we have uh, what I would say to be an unusually high uh, a number of interracial marriages and mixed families, uh, starting right from the top with myself. My wife is a second generation West Indian. And so this has been very meaningful in talking about diaspora because we have many uh, immigrants who are part of our congregation and also talking about hybridity because we have an incredible amount I'm able to put better language to it now after being here but of uh, hybrid children hybrid cultures coming together and so we're very excited about going home and building on this and seeing what God would do um, as we talk about communion one of the things that we've been really working on in our church because you can imagine 
having that many nations coming together, that many cultures, um, you know, uh, hybrid children, figuring out where they fit, um, some of the uh, different challenges that will arise with that. Uh, one of the things God's really spoken, and actually something else I'll mention is we actually, five years ago as well, were a product of a church merge. So I actually came to be a pastor because I was invited to come and be the lead pastor and take a church that I had planted and to come together with a more established congregation and merge together. So that made life even more fun and interesting as well. Uh, and so Jair and his wife were a very important part of that, coming from the church, the other side of things, it, working together. And so something that God has really spoken to us about has become so important to us and we're growing in, we're learning, is the concept of family and understanding how important family is. The primary New Testament revelation of God that he gives us is a father. We know there's many revelations of God. There's many revelations of who he is, his name. But as we move into the New Testament context, the primary way he chose to reveal himself is his father. And Jesus was revealed as the son. And so this concept of family is so key to us. Um, and it's so important because if we build on this revelation, now, okay, if the primary revelation of God is the father, uh, then when we receive him as father, we're invited into a family. And when we're invited into a family... Uh, not only do we now receive a father, but if I receive a father and you have the same father and you have the same father, we all have the same father, and then we become brothers and sisters. And so what unites us beyond our different cultures, our different nations of origin, our different backgrounds, even finding identity when we come from a hybrid situation, uh, when there's two very different churches trying to merge together, what unites us is rallying around this fact that we are family, that we have a father, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and that us being family together supersedes everything else, and that, you know, even in uh, a marriage, if we will say that, I don't know if it's the same for all of you, but anything I've ever observed that God's put together is he takes two very different people, and he brings them together as one. And, uh, and our differences now become our combined strength and our combined unity together. And so we've really been working on what does it mean and what does it look like to do church as family? And how do we walk as family? And what does it really mean to even take the different nations and the differences that we have and, and walk together as one in family? Because you know in family, even in your family, in my family, we're very different. Uh, but we're still family. We're still together. And so when I think about family, one of my uh, favorite memories of my family is sitting around the table and eating together. Uh, I think this is something that transcends culture. It transcends nations. There's something about getting together with family and eating a meal. Um, yeah, I have wonderful memories growing up of family dinners together. Even now, my family will get together, all us kids and all the grandkids. And virtually every time we get together, we eat together. When we come for special occasions, there's always a family meal. And so it's interesting because on the night that Jesus was betrayed, right before he goes to the cross, they didn't understand it, but he understood he was about to swing open, wide open the doors to family. He was about to be the only begotten son who laid down his life to be that seed that fell to the ground and died so there'd be much fruit of many sons and daughters. And so what he did was he sat with his disciples and he said, hey, we're going we're gonna to eat together. We're going to have a, a meal together. And this is actually a meal that I want you to carry forward. This is a meal that I want you to eat together on a regular basis because that's what family does. Family eats together on a regular basis. And so, of course, when we take communion, there is definitely a vertical element to it. There's an element of it's remembering our Lord and Savior. It's remembering what he's done. It's remembering what he has purchased for us. Uh, and that is obviously central because you don't have family without a father. You know, father, a father defines family but there is also just as much, and we're coming to understand this, a horizontal element where there's power in communion that we are remembering him. But it's interesting. You can't take communion by yourself. It's very legitimate. It's very powerful. But there's something about taking communion with your family. There's something about eating that meal together. So we're on this journey of learning to be family. And taking communion together is part of that. And so what I'm thankful for and excited tonight is... Uh, the last several days, I've had an opportunity to meet many new, well, not new family members. It's just I've met them for the first time from around the world, from 19 different nations. And so we get to eat this meal together, 
remembering him, but also being connected one to another. Amen? Amen. Amen. Dr. Joy. Reverend uh, Don DeLaca, former president of the Binisher Bible College, one of the oldest Bible colleges in the Philippines, started in 1926. I was privileged to address the commencement exercises three years ago. And now uh, he transitioned from the school to become the vice president for missions of the Christian and Missionary Alliance of the Philippines. Don was a pastor for more than 15 years in the city of San Diego before he took the challenge to return and minister to his own people here in the Philippines. Pastor Don. Thank you, Pastor Joy. <clears throat> I'd like to, sorry, I had, I'd like to change the question that you wanted us to share with. How will we celebrate the Lord's Supper in our context? Instead, I'd like to drive it closer to home. So I'd like to say today, uh, what does the Lord's Supper mean to me? as I celebrate it with you. In the book of Matthew, we read this. The Lord Jesus Christ said, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. 2014 of May, I flew back to Los Angeles after spending two years with Ebenezer Bible College, after coming back after 13 years actually, 14 probably, being pastor of Grace Alliance Church. The reason I came, I went to LA was my daughter spent two years taking her uh, junior and senior year was graduating from high school. After graduation, Five days after she graduated, we took her back home. She was in tears, of course. I couldn't understand that. A few months after we arrived from the Philippines, around October or November, she was crying and I looked at her and said, what's wrong? And this is what she said. You never even allowed me to say goodbye to my friends. I didn't know how to react. I just kept quiet. <laughs> and I said, I didn't say anything. I couldn't understand the pain that she was going through. Let me read another verse. <laughs> The Apostle Paul said this, For as often as you drink, as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Yesterday we heard a presentation on the hybrid kids and how we can celebrate that, presented by our Mom Miriam. Let me read to you something that hit deep in my heart. She said this, if we make deep friendships overseas, we can never completely go home again. There will be some pain. This is the price we pay for loving and being loved in more than one place. 
And then she goes on to say this. Lament is a biblical activity. The alternative is numbness when the pain is great. Lament lets us feel authentically. The Japanese, fra the Japanese have a phrase, mono an no aware, about the pain we feel when we see something beautiful because we cannot keep the beauty. It just snapped. And I understood the pain that my daughter went through. I sent her a message. And I said, I'm sorry. I did not allow you to grieve the loss of your friends. And then I sent her this phrase. She responded after a few hours. I couldn't understand why it took her so long. And he said, I cry, Daddy. It's spot on. It's OK, Daddy. I forgive you. And the change and brokenness made us stronger. That encouraged my heart. But the word of God says, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I said, Lord God, I want to see more than this. I felt the forgiveness. I knew the forgiveness. I know God has forgiven me. And I knew my daughter was going to be fine. This morning, late this morning, he sent, she sent me another message. And this is what she said. This really made me the happiest father. He said, I had the opportunity to empower this girl. She sent me a picture who is running for Miss CBA in the Miss Silliman pageant this year. She is planning on to do the advocacy similar of mine last year to bring discipleship to the campus. You see, my daughter ran for Miss Silliman, and her advocacy was, let's bring back Jesus to Silliman. They talked her out of it. The they said, you're not going to win. This is not, this is not going to work for you. And she said, no. This is what I feel God wants for me. Today, I know God has set her free. Because she was willing to share it with someone who was doing the same thing. The word of God. In Isaiah said, he was smitten and afflicted of God, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And by his stripes, we are healed. What does the communion mean to me today? It means healing. It means forgiveness. It means that us, we celebrate this. We can celebrate the Lord's death and proclaim it until he comes because it works. It worked with my hybrid kid who spent most of her life in the United States being a philom who felt the pain of what it meant to live behind friends, family members, to be renewed by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So as I celebrate today, I celebrate the goodness of the Lord because it hits deep home in my heart. God bless you. Then take me a long time to adopt him as my good friend. Just half an hour in the middle. 
I'll listen carefully. At the end of our meal together, I committed to God, I will pray for him and his people. Came from Burma, Mema, this suffering church he represents. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I women from Myanmar. So this is a very first time uh, standing uh, in front of many scholars, uh, many missionary, many pastor here. So I excited. Uh, I would like to. I tell you a little bit about uh, how we celebrate a uh, communion among uh, Myanmar people. Uh, right now, uh, I live in, in Bangkok, uh, Thailand, for uh, Myanmar ministry, and I teach in a small a group in our church after uh, church service. And I am responsible for teaching. Uh, before I came to um, Thailand for my study and my ministry, and I had been uh, in the church for over uh, six years. So uh, according to uh, my understanding and my experiences in Myanmar, every uh, first Sunday, or the week, oh, sorry, every Sunday or the month, uh, we celebrate a communion. So I see many uh, purposes, uh, many understanding about communion in my country. Uh, right now, uh, I would like to share a little bit about how uh, we celebrate communion in my church. So my church is in Bora area. Uh, that is uh, uh, located uh, between Thailand and uh, Myanmar. So in my church, uh, there are many uh, different tribes. Uh, may, I, uh, may I say a little bit about uh, the tribes in Myanmar? There are about uh, 100 and that is it tries in Myanmar. So uh, even though uh, we had uh, 136 tribes in Myanmar, uh, the majority is uh, the Bami groups. So sometimes we call Myanmar. So this is also Bami's. So on the other hand, uh, there are many different tribes in Myanmar. Uh, uh, we had uh, seven uh, states and seven divisions in Myanmar. So especially uh, Kachin State, uh, Chan State, and uh, Karan State, uh, there is always uh, conflicts and fights between Yama Army and uh, many and this, uh, different groups. So because of that, uh, many people uh, living in the remote area, uh, they are facing uh, problems and difficulty so they lost their opportunity. So that's why our community is uh, very meaningful to my church. So the meaning for us is that whenever we celebrate communion, we remember uh, the love of Jesus for everyone. So the meaning is uh, to show our love among our brother in the church. On the other hand, uh, we are to show our love, our mercy to uh, the needy, the poor, uh, the persecutors, 
trust the Basikudes people around um, Myanmar areas. So, uh, whenever we celebrate communion, we uh, call us a uh, donation. So that is for uh, the Basikude church, uh, Basikude people, the needy, the poor. So for me, uh, communion is uh, very important and uh, very meaningful because uh, because of God's love and uh, God's salvation, so uh, we receive love, uh, we receive freedom. So that's why other people, they chose uh, receive freedom, love, mercy from us, from God. So that's why uh, communion is um, to give uh, what we have to other people, especially uh, to give what we have to the persecuted people. So that is all. Thank you so much. Dr. Jaki, you ministered in the Arabian Peninsula among the Chinese migrant workers. Thank you. 1950, 1949, in China, there was less than one million Christian. And then the communist China took over China. In fact, at that time, missiologists from the West, basically almost 99% of them predicted that that is the end of the church in China. About 28 years later, when China finally opened up in 1978, not only that the, ch the church didn't die, in fact, it flourished over 20 to 30 times. At that time, it was estimated Christian population in China have around 20 to 30 million. Fast forward, in the 1990s to year 2000, China opened up her door, a lot of Chinese, in fact, a well, Chinese diaspora, can now send out all over the world. I go back a little bit. During the Dark Age, during the persecution of the church, in fact, a lot of Chinese living in Hong Kong, living in other parts of the world, they left and then moved to North America. And of course, the Chinese diaspora in those parts of the world flourished. In 2003, my wife and I were sent out to the Arabian Peninsula with the purpose of reaching out to the Chinese diaspora, living in the Arabian Peninsula. I still remember after we have served there, reach out, planting the very first church. After about two years, we served Chinese, Chinese Christian came to the Lord in the Arabian Peninsula. And there are Chinese Christians who, are, who came to the Lord from China, or maybe from Europe, or maybe from North America. They all came. I still remember in one of the, every time at that time, because we all come from different parts of the world, different tradition. I have to say they were fighting against each other. In fact, the easiest part, the Chinese believer, is well, we led them to Christ. So basically, whatever they learn from there, they basically well, obey and follow. But for others, because they have their own church tradition, some would say that I only observe the, whole, the Holy Communion once a year. Others, they might say that I observe once a month. Others, they will say that we observe every time when we meet. Are we going to use one bread, or one big cup, or many wafers, say, we will use, or many cups? I know that during the Reformation, the Western Church have already thought over those issues. 
In fact, JR was in the middle of that. I still remember in one of the Sunday morning, as I officiate past the element, I watch out a brother. He has been very vocal, and he has been saying that, Pastor, I want to help you to pastor your church. I've been doing that eh, in China. But I noticed that that brother refused to participate in the Holy Communion. Later on, I asked him, Brother, why didn't you partake the Holy Communion? And then he said, I come from the tradition that I only, I only participate that once a year. What are you going to do with him? And then I said, basically, it is not about your tradition. Do you know why in your tradition you only celebrate once a year? Because you are waiting for an ordained pastor to come to your church. Because there is not that many ordained pastors in China. So they only visit your church once a year. So that's why you observe the Holy Communion once a year. And basically I told him that. You have been asking me to give you ministry opportunity. But for the very simple fact that you refuse to participate in this Holy Communion, how can I partner with you in the kingdom ministry? He was very mad. He was very mad. And then I know that from that week onward, he didn't come to the church. Four weeks later, he came back. In fact, eh, he came and apologized to me. He said that, you know what? For the past three weeks, God has spoken to me. And I felt, I didn't feel any peace. On top of that, I have deep pain eh, on my leg. And I know that God is using those things to teach me a lesson. So I repent. I come here and ask for forgiveness. And then the following week, he joined the Holy Communion. And it, the pain on his neck subsided. And from that day, I honor the promise that I make to him. Then later on, I invite him to co-teach a Sunday school. Doing diaspora mission is messy. I just share with you one of the things that I've gone through. Basically, every single details we have to fight, especially people from different walks of life join or, or questions, they come. And I'm so thankful. I want to share that just to encourage churches that are suffering. God is at work. God is at work. He is the host for the table. And then continue to invite you and I to come, including those who are suffering, including those who are not in the kingdom yet. And this is the reason why we gather here. Not only commemorate, we proclaim the Lord. And then as we do that, we expect eh, his return. And we are so thankful. And this is the reason why we participate in mission. Because there are so many, so many, they are not, they do not know the table has been set out, laid out from our Lord and invite you and I to come in. Now I'm really thankful. The Chinese diaspora is the largest diaspora, as I, well, after Mexican, I have to say that, in terms of number, over 140 million outside Taiwan, Hong Kong, Macau. Doesn't include that. There is still much work to do. But what I'm sharing that I'm really hopeful. The Chinese church is not just, just think about Chinese reaching out to the Chinese. There are several mission movements. Lausanne sponsor Mission China 2030, and I'm really thankful that the Chinese church in China, especially the city house churches, God give them a vision. By 2030, they would like to send out at least 20,000 international workers, missionaries, to reach out to the world. Why 20,000? Basically, they said that 
when we look back for the past 200 years, the whole church, the global church, have at least sent 20,000 missionaries to China and help us. For the Chinese church to be called Mission China, at least we have to pay that gospel debt, send out 20,000. The number is not important. I think it's the editor. And this is the reason why we are here. Continue to encourage one another. So we are so thankful. Let's come to the table. Not only us in here, maybe think about it, the empty seats in here. Not only our co-workers, especially those who do not know Jesus yet. And this is why we come to the table to celebrate and then to remember, to pray and ask God to use you and I to further his mission. Why don't we sing a couple of choruses with uh, our specialists? Right there. Brother, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Can we sing that? Shall we all stand? Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to you thy great salvation so One more time. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great Salvation so rich and free. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. So Pastor Jackie will lead us in prayer, and you be seated, and you will be served. Let us continue, remain standing as we pray. Let us all pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you. Thank you, Lord. You are our creator, God, and you make us whole. Father God, we know that we are just dust, but you have called us to be your children. Not only that, you invite us to the table. And you invite us to co-work with you, to bring the gospel, to share your goodness. And of all, so that we will share your gospel, share your love, and invite many others to come and follow you. And thank you, Lord Jesus, for you were peace for our transgressions. You was crushed for our integrity, iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on you. And by your wounds, we are healed. And thank you, Lord, we gather here at the table. We remember 
the great price that you have shared in our stead. Father God, we are the one. We are the one because we are sinners. But you die in our stead so that we can become your children. And thank you, Lord. Not only that, you give us a special position in the kingdom because you call us, you allow us to become your children. We all become princesses and princes of the kingdom of God. Father God, we give you thanks for the wonderful, wonderful exchange. We know that we are all sinners, but you call us to participate in your great work. Father God, we pray for your presence, the presence of the Holy Spirit, to empower us, to anoint us, to guide us. As we partake bread and partake the cup, we know that this is your body, your body in our stead, shed for us. Father God, we praise you for the cup because you have said that this cup is the new covenant in your blood. Do this whenever we drink it in remembrance of you. Father God, we praise you that we can gather here as one body, as family, to participate in the Holy Communion. And thank you, Lord. And we pray that your Holy Spirit continue to guide us, direct us, so that not only that we proclaim you, but also we invite others to come into the kingdom, invite them to join this great commission so many more will come and call you as our Father. And thank you, Lord, that we gather here tonight. We praise you in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Can I ask about our brothers to come? Okay. Yeah. You will be served with the element and we will partake together.
worship with this song. I'll just sing the chorus. If you know it, you can join along, and we can worship our Lord with this. and the champions. No losers must come. Two weeks ago, my son and my two grandsons, we were watching the Stanley Cup 
championship game between Las Vegas and Washington. Washington won the cup. After the game, they came together around the cup. They drank, they yelled, they yelled. The victors were yelling, we are the champion. We are made conquerors and champions by Jesus Christ. Who may partake mm -hmm. only champions. Jesus claimed to be the bread of life. And those who eat the bread will always be winner, for he will be sustained till the end, not just one game, end of the league. Let's partake together. Many of us are tired and weary. Many of us are discouraged. Renew our strength. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the bread of life. Having you is having everything we need. We hold the cup of the victors. Broken dreams and broken hope are made whole again by Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Thank you for renewing us, body, soul, and spirit. Amen. I will call our senior missionary to come, Dr. Ron Adekai. Will you lead us for the prayer of healing? And those of you who are not feeling well, those of you who have health challenges, would you please stand from where you are? And I encourage our brothers and sisters to surround these brothers or sisters who have some challenges physically, emotionally. Just surround them, these people who will stand. Our brother is standing. Will you please, three, four, five of you, go around him and lay your hands on him? Are there any others? Our brother from Ethiopia. Our sister. Let's pray for one another. Let your hands be the extension of the hands of the healer. Pastor Ram. Are there any more who is not feeling well? 
more at the back. Let's surround each other. Let's pray for one another. Others who are in need of mental, not just physical or maybe spiritual needs, you may request for prayer and pray for them too. you, O oh God, for this privilege of sharing these moments with you. We rejoice in your presence with us today. Thank you, Lord, for the ones who have shown their needs. We come freely to you because we are a needy people. And yet, Lord, you have fulfilled everything that we need for us spiritually and also physically we believe and you have said that those who are sick we need to pray for them too according to James and we come with those physical needs as well thank you for listening to our needs physical needs mm -hmm. and our prayers for them and also those who have other needs as well in terms of emotional, psychological, relationships, mental, and even those who are not here, our loved ones, we remember them too. We pray for them. 
we know that you're going to answer them. We want to praise you and as we continue to celebrate your presence, we want to rejoice and thank you for the one who answers our prayer beyond our asking or even thinking. We praise you, we thank you today. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.